Hello and welcome to Constructive Wine Online, uh, class 5 of Wine 101. It's a five class course and today is our fifth and final in the series. I'm delighted to join you here and be with you today as you view from uh, uh, Constructive Wine Online. For today's class we'll look at what I call specialty wines, uh, wines made in a unique way, uh, a little bit different than traditional red, white and rosé winemaking techniques, uh, so namely uh, fortified and sparkling wines. Uh, as well as we'll do a, a, a little dive into one of the best lessons I've had um, in my wine wine studying career in uh, uh, eno literacy, so this, the ability to read a wine label and detect which clues and common elements uh, are key to understanding uh, wines and what they might taste like. Okay, so for today's class, I have two fortified wines. Can you tell which one was made or which were made with red grape varieties or white grape varieties? I'll give you a clue. One's a port and one's a sherry. So we'll take a look at those uh, after sparkling wines a little bit later in today's class. So first, sparkling wines uh, come in many different styles, produced in many uh, regions throughout the world, such as Germany, where they call it Sect, or Spain, where they call it Cava. Uh, Italy has Asti and Prosecco, made in unique ways. France has Champagne, Cremant, two different styles and regions, uh, different, different sparkling wines. And throughout the, what's called the, the, the New World, we have um, various wine regions in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, United States, uh, as well as many other uh, New World and uh, places outside of uh, Europe um, producing sparkling wines. The leader by far in terms of quantity as well as quality, I would dare to say, although the latter is being caught up uh, quickly by various New World producers as well as some traditional method producers uh, throughout France and other parts. Uh, of Europe, uh, but uh, Champagne is the leader in terms of quality and quantity and is located in northern France, just uh, about an hour's drive, hour and a half drive from Paris in northern France at about 48 to 49 degrees latitude. Uh, so as we saw in class one, that's right at the uh, viable limit of uh, wine growing uh, and wine production, which is why the traditional method of sparkling wine lends itself so well to this high acid, uh, very flavorful, uh, naturally dry, naturally uh, quite uh, delicate and ephemeral uh, champagne wine. It is a 100% traditional method. They call it the champagne method, which is a very labor intensive way of producing the second fermentation in the bottle. I'll let you uh, uh, research that if you're not uh, familiar with it. It's very interesting. Uh, or are you familiar with the traditional champagne method? The grape varieties they use, uh, we discussed a little bit in class two uh, on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but those are two of the dominant grape varieties, as well as Pinot Meunier, a clone of Pinot Noir, or an off offspring of Pinot Noir, and the third grape variety used in traditional Champagne production. Some producers include Moet et Chandon, Bolleger, Louis Rodereux, uh, pardon my uh, English accent. Uh, Ruinau, uh, one of the oldest, I believe Ruinau is the oldest uh, champagne house producing since uh, early 18th century. Nicolas Feuillette is a cooperative which produces and bottles and sells sh traditional method champagne, champagne wines all under the same uh, cooperative label, Nicolas Feuillette. This is very common in uh, in Champagne, especially uh, various parts of the region. And a final producer, Lanson, just to get a taste of different um, producers of, of traditional, method, traditional method Champagne. A second style of traditional method sparkling wine produced in France, but outside of the Champagne district, uh, is called Crema. Are you familiar with this style of wine? It can be a really excellent value. Uh, it's produced in regions like Alsace using local varieties, white grape varieties, as well as red Pinot Noir in Alsace for its rosé uh, crema. 
Loire Valley and Bourgogne uh, using local uh, varieties as well. So in the Loire, that can be uh, an indigenous grape variety called Gros Lot, or as well Chenin Blanc, uh, as well as Cabernet Franc for the Rosé. And in Bourgogne, they use uh, local varieties, predominantly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, as well as Aligoté and Gamay Noir. So another uh, in our final sparkling wine style or sparkling wine that we'll discuss is Prosecco. It took the world by storm in 2009 when it was formally, the grape variety was called Prosecco, uh, but they uh, changed that to its traditional name Glera. So Prosecco is made by the grape variety Glera. And uh, th then they could have the appellation which included the village of Prosecco uh, as, a, as a DOC. Uh, DOC. And then in the, so it's produced all throughout Veneto, as well as Friuli Venezia Giulia. And in the north of Veneto, in the hillsides, is Conegliano Valdobbia Dene. And this is the steep hillside DOCG, traditional, uh, still tank method, can be traditional method. Uh, but for the most part, uh, Prosecco comes from the flat plains, is high yields, uh, tank method, sparkling wine, that is a little bit sweet, uh, so it, it might say brute, in which case it is less than 1% sweetness, and hence dry. Uh, or it might say extra dry, which is actually about 2% uh, sweetness, so a little bit more than uh, brute, for example. All right, so we've looked at a few sparkling wines just to get a little taste, and we'll look at two of the classic fortified wines. So do you know what makes a wine fortified? Why do we call it fortified wines? Two classic styles are port, which I have here, and sherry, which I have here, as well as Madeira from the Portuguese island uh, in the Atlantic. And um, if you're not familiar with this, I highly recommend doing a little research on the island of Madeira and its wines, its fortified wines. There are also Vin du Naturel from France, and uh, Ruther Glen Muscat is a, a Australian fortified uh, sticky uh, dessert wine. So we'll look predominantly at uh, port and sherry production. But what is fortification? It is the addition of a grape spirit, a distilled grape brandy, uh, added to the wine. So wines don't naturally get up to 20% by natural fermentation. They'll usually stop at 15 or 16% at most. Uh, but with fortification, with addition of spirit and grape brandy, they found that the wines were more stable and more durable. I mean, they've, they started doing this at least as far back as the 14th century CE, perhaps earlier. And so the wines weren't necessarily stable in the voyages. And so this extra fortification and strength of brandy uh, boosted up to 20% or sometimes uh, this sherry, for example, is 18.5, uh, but it can vary from 15 to 20 or 22% uh, alcohol by volume. So let's take a look at port. Port is a fortified uh, sweet wine and they fortify it. They add the brandy during the fermentation which means that the yeast stop fermenting the sugar, and so it will, it will be sweet. So this is a, a Colieta, fortified uh, tawny port, and it is quite sweet. And strong, 20% alcohol, so you get a bit of that heat, a bit of that uh, spice, and um, uh, the Duro is where port is produced in the upper, let's see if I can see this here. So in the, oh. <laughs> so uh, in the in the northeast corner of Portugal, as the Duero River flows through Spain and comes into Portugal, in the upper Duro Superior, it turns into the Duro in uh, Portugal, which flows uh, downstream through the Superior, and then the Sima Corgo, and then the Bikesa Corgo, and then continues to flow out and west out to the coast, the Atlantic coast, and Porto, and the village of Oporto, where many port shippers are based and uh, have traditionally been based. And they would ship their ports uh, all around the world, and uh, just, a, just a really nice style. So what, uh, what is the style of port? 
Well, it depends on the aging process. So if it's aged in wooden barrels, in oak barrels, uh, usually neutral used oak barrels from week one, we saw that after about three or four or five uses, just like a tea bag, an oak barrel will lose its natural vanillins and flavors and just be, it'll be good for continued uh, oxidative aging. So we talk about wood aged ports, oxidative aged ports like tawny or from uh, a tawny port from one vintage is a colieta. And that's what I have here, a 10 year old uh, Colieta port. And it's um, very delicious, uh, quite complex, but still uh, soft and not maybe as integrated with its high alcohol as a 20 year old uh, or 15 or 20 year old Colieta or uh, uh, average age tawny port. But still quite, quite smooth and complex and uh, really quite delicious being now we're 2024. 20, so it's probably about 12 or 13 years in, in wooden barrels. The other style that uh, ports are made in is a bottle aged uh, style. So this is uh, vinified within the Duro Superior and uh, Upper Duro and then tur turned into a wine and aged for only about two years in wood and then put, put into the bottle. So that would give you a ruby port and that's ready for sale and consumption within, within a year or two. And then if it's a late bottled vintage, have you heard of this term LBV? It's a style of port that is a, it's a ruby port that is bottled a little bit later, uh, a few years after uh, the ruby styles are bottled. So maybe four or five, up to seven years as an LBV. And these can provide excellent value and give you a taste of um, a little bit of vintage port uh, and a little bit of uh, wood age uh, colieta or tawny port, but a really unique, uh, interesting style uh, on its own and, and great value as well. Uh, and then vintage ports are the uh, reign supreme. They're really the best, best, only declared in the best growing conditions and the best uh, vineyard sites in these steep, you know, Duro, have you seen a photo of the, the upper Duro Valley? These steep uh, terraced vineyards are beautiful, stunningly beautiful. And uh, the best vineyards produce the best wines in the best years. And those are called vintage uh, ports. And those can age for um, in declared years, we saw 2011 uh, was a declared year, I believe 2017. And uh, wines laid down in these epic vintages can cellar for, because of the fortification and the quality of the red wine must and, and the port wine, can age for 40 or 50 or maybe 80 or more uh, years in a good cellar. All right, so moving on to another, uh, so the second uh, famous fortified wine of today's class. We have uh, Sp Spanish Sherry, produced in the region of Jerez, also known as Zeres or Sherry, or Jerez. And um, it forms a triangle with El Puerto de Santa Maria, as well as San Lucar de Barameda, and the town of Jerez called the Sherry Triangle, and these very famous uh, white Albariza soils. Um, again, getting a little bit technical, but uh, very fine wines produced from white uh, grape varieties. Uh, so especially Palomino for um, producing a, a wine like this, Amontillado. Take a look at that on the next slide. And like port, uh, sherry wines also depend on the aging process. So if it's what's called biologically aged, this is a special maturation technique done in half filled or you know two thirds filled barrels, as you can see. And there's a special layer of yeast film, yeast cells that uh, they call the floor. And they form a barrier, an oxidative protective barrier that allows it to age biologically. And these are very fine uh, manzanilla and fino sherries. So manzanilla on the coast in San Lucar de Barmeda and Fino throughout Jerez is a very, very fine, um, light and food friendly uh, sherry wine. So with fish or um, Iberico ham, almonds, olives, you know, um, Mediterranean diet kind of thing. Um, so we have manzanilla and Fino. And then aged oxidatively, so there's no floor, it's exposed directly to the oxygen within the barrel as these sherry wines age. We have wine styles like Palo Cortado, Amontillado, Oloroso, 
And these are bone dry, so they call them vinos generosos, and there's zero, less than two grams of residual sugar per liter. So very, very minimal, probably the least, I mean, manzanilla and fino sherry due to the winemaking and floor maturation process are probably the two lowest sugar uh, wine styles available. Uh, so certainly dry wines are available with less than five grams per liter, uh, but manzanilla and fino and also these oxidatively aged sherries uh, can be even less than four or five grams per liter. So very dry styles and tend to be a little bit uh, nuttier. I've got an Amont Amontillado here. So um, yeah, a little bit of that heat, um, kind of raisin, almost a dried dried grape. Raisin. This is the Lustau, uh, Lustau House, and it's their Los Arcos Amontillado. Yeah, so a little bit of that kind of tang from the uh, oxidative uh, pr wine production and a bit of that uh, kind of nutty almond or walnut, um, raisin, and a little bit of heat from, um, from the alcohol, from the fortification. Moving on to uh, cream cherries and uh, sweet styles. So the five on the left are vinos generosos, manzanilla, fino, pelo cortado, amontillado, oloroso. And the five on the right are sweet uh, sherry styles. So we have pale cream, medium cream, cream sherry, as well as um, muscatel is a, a dried raisin fortified uh, sweet sherry. And finally, Pedro Jimenez or PX is a great variety as well as a wine style. And that's what we see here in this photo is they're uh, drying the Pedro Jimenez grapes and completely raisinating them. They'll then go light fermentation, do a fortification during that fermentation, stopping it and preserving a lot of that really raisin rich, sweet, can be very unctuous and really a delicious style with just about any dessert. I mean, uh, fruit tarts or sorry, uh, butter tarts might be one of the sweetest desserts or certainly among the most. And uh, Pedro Jimenez can be great with that, can be great on uh, vanilla ice cream, uh, really just a delicious, um, rich, you don't want too much of it, but a very nice uh, fortified style. Great, so we'll pause there for just a minute. We can take a break um, before going on to our next and final lesson on how to read a wine label. Uh, one of the best um, lessons I've had and certainly an interesting uh, strategy and, and tips and tricks to help you uh, read uh, wine labels. I recommend uh, if you want to check out uh, a Second Cheapest Wine on YouTube. Uh, it's a YouTube uh, clip from what's called College Humor and uh, really funny stuff, good, give you a good laugh and um, and give you give you some uh, encouragement for, for why you might want to pay attention and apply some of the strategies uh, in the coming uh, lesson on reading a wine label. So I'll pause there. Okay, welcome back. Great to have you uh, here in the asynchronous uh, virtual classroom on Constructive Wine Online. And we're looking at how to read a wine label in this last section of Class 5, Wine 101. And uh, hope you checked out Second Cheapest Wine on YouTube. A great, great clip and uh, maybe a motivation to uh, flex your muscle and show, you know, if you've studied this course, this Wine 101 course, uh, maybe some other readings and maybe you're inspired and uh, continue to read and study uh, wine. Um, it'll help you in, in some of these situations uh, that we saw in the video. So what are the clues we can look for on a label? Uh, think of a, a wine label as a piece, piece of uh, ID. It's got a lot of information and some of that can include uh, the producer, which is probably the biggest key in terms of uh, quality of the wine, high quality producers versus uh, doesn't mean uh, not popular. Popular isn't the same as quality, but uh, some producers are, are better known for better vineyard sites, better, high, better quality, etc. It can have the region or appellation. Uh, we'll take a look at that on the next slide, next couple of slides. It may have stated uh, grape varieties. We saw in uh, week two with the Merlot from Decoy that it was, um, you know, said right on there Merlot. It may be implied in the region or appellation. So uh, Bordeaux, right bank, uh, for example, might be Merlot, it might be a blend. Uh, and so you have to kind of 
kind of know that can be the tricky part where it's not stated but easily searched. And as you study wines of Europe, wines of um, the world, you can learn in particular which grapes are grown where uh, with this course and, and many other courses as well. Uh, the vintage should be stated on most, almost all labels. Some labels like this uh, sherry uh, that I have, uh, sparkling wine, are blended from multiple vintages. So it's called non-vintage, but it's really a blend of multiple uh, vintages, so they don't put a particular number. Uh, but most table wines, uh, so still wines, will have the vintage that the grapes were grown and harvested. So in the southern hemisphere, grapes are harvested in the February, March, or April, if you recall from class one. And so it would have that, that vintage on the label. Whereas in the Northern Hemisphere, grapes are harvested during, do you remember? Or do you know? And so it'll have that, that vintage from, from that time um, when the grapes are harvested and grown in the Northern Hemisphere. It also has the alcohol by volume. So the amount that the yeast, the amount of sugar that was in the grapes, the ripeness of the grapes, and the amount that the yeast converted that into alcohol, the fine alcohol within here in Canada, it can be within 1%, plus or minus, of, of the label. So the actual alcohol of the wine is uh, not necessarily what's on the label, but usually within 1 or 1.5% 1 uh, alcohol by volume. Again, ranging from 10 or 11 on the lower end for many white wines to 14 or 15% alcohol by volume uh, for some red wines and everywhere in, in between. Here is a producer from a, a, a French uh, vineyard. So the appellation there is uh, Chardonnay du Pape. So here we have the appellation is a first clue that it's going to come. So uh, which grape varieties are grown in Chardonnay du Pape? Do you recall from the Southern Rhone lesson? And what kind of climate is it? What, can we expect it to be, you know, this a ABV alcohol by volume? That's 14.5%. Seems, seems about right for many Chateau Neuf du Pop. Uh, region as well, Chateau Neuf du Pop, as well as the Appalachian. And here we have the producer, Domaine du Pégao. So it can take a bit of practice to learn which one's the producer, which one's the region, etc. But um, with practice, it, it'll come as a skill. Uh, uh, North American or New World uh, wine regions tend to be a little bit easier, a little bit um, easier to interpret than say German wine labels or many Italian wine labels. Uh, but uh, in any event, it will have the, it may have the grape variety, in this case Pinot Noir, it will have the, the region, the Appalachian. In the United States they call it American Viticultural Area, so AVA, and this one's Russian River Valley. And here we have the producer, a uh, large producer, Rodney Strong. Okay, so in addition to that information, uh, you may have, or you, you ought to have uh, in Canada, as well as um, many other uh, United States, excuse me, in Europe, as well as the United Kingdom, have regulations to have uh, these, this information on the labels of alcohol and, and wines uh, sold uh, commercially. So alcohol by volume, as mentioned, usually in a percent uh, by volume maybe by um, weight in the United States, uh, so, but in any event, a percent of alcohol, as well as the volume of the fluid. It's not necessarily going to be spot on. It can vary up to 5%, roughly. I, I believe about 5% a variance from the 750 milliliters or 75 centiliters, um, uh, or, or maybe 375 or 500, but most will have, they'll all have the volume, and most will have uh, 750 uh, milliliters, about 25 0.36 ounces. Uh, it'll have the country of origin and the address of the producer, as well as a message saying contains sulfites. This is a hotly discussed topic and uh, won't get into it uh, in this uh, series, but uh, just to say that uh, legally in most countries it must contain state, it must state that the wine contains sulfites, which are naturally produced during fermentation uh, and contain sulfites as well as during the winemaking uh, process. Some other information can include the appellation. So French AOC, Appellation Origine Contrôlée. In Canada, for British Columbia and Ontario, we have the Vintners Quality Alliance, VQA. 
as well as French DOCG's DOC we've seen. We've seen Spain's DO and DOCA. And this just this gives valuable information, which, uh, like the photo ID, uh, in this case gives an example of provenance, where you came from, where the wine came from, uh, and the specific appellation, the specific name, whether it's champagne, or port, or sherry, or um, uh, you know Chateau Neuf du Pape, or um, uh, let's say uh, Gevry Chambertin from Bourgogne. If it says that AOC, that appellation, legally it must come from those vineyards and that, that region. You may see mise en bouteille au, dom au domaine, and this indicates that uh, it was bottled on the estate rather than uh, vi vinified, fermented, crushed, fermented, and then shipped to a bottling uh, facility, which is common, or e even uh, another example could be uh, bottled at source, so shipped as a bulk wine and bottled uh, at the arriving country. Uh, but in this case, it's mise en bouteille at this, at this domain, this uh, winery. Other valuable information includes uh, organic. This is the EU symbol, at least last I checked. And it currently is the EU symbol for organic, as well as the Demeter um, biodynamic symbol. And sustainable can have um, emblems as well, regulated uh, information labeled on the or stamped on the label. You might see oaked or more often unoaked to indicate uh, Chablis style Chardonnay. Uh, unoaked, so without the oak aging, and you can see uh, class one for uh, how that uh, goes about. Okay, well, thank you very much. You made it to the end of Wine 101, Constructive Wine Online. Uh, it was a five class course that I had previously recorded up to Constructive Wine Online and thought to produce uh, fresh for you to enjoy. And just to recap, uh, we're looking at uh, various concepts. We had five, five um, classes. So we looked at uh, the four factors of wine appreciation, appearance, nose, palette and finish, as well as terroir and uh, fermentation. Looked at many grape varieties in class two. Looked at wine regions of France, such as Loire Valley, as well as Rhone Valley, Bourgogne, Bordeaux. We looked at Italy, many regions of Europe and uh, New World as well. So outside of Europe, such as Canada, United States, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. And today's class we covered, uh, we also did food and wine, looking at food and wine pairing. So I do encourage you to uh, practice that if you're into it at all. Uh, do some more research, go buy some wines, go get different foods and cheeses and, and test it out and apply some of the principles uh, from class four. And of course we had sparkling wine and fortified wine today, as well as how to read a wine label. I hope you've enjoyed. I've enjoyed this immensely, and um, I hope you'll tune in for more constructive wine online. Uh, my name is Malcolm Lamont, and it's been a pleasure uh, to be here with you or be there with you, and I uh, hope you enjoy as well, and uh, uh, thank you so much. Cheers.